Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another United States Study Center webinar, uh, part of our intense series of webinars leading up to the US election now less than a week away. Today, we're joined by uh, a, a large cast of uh, my colleagues uh, from the US Study Center, who I'll introduce presently. But uh, let me begin by acknowledging that the United States Study Center and the University of Sydney stands on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people who are part of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, earlier this week, the United States Study Center launched Red Book, Blue Book, uh, an Australian guide to the next US administration. This is um, drawing on a parlance often uh, used in, in government, um, two briefing books, one depending on uh, what election outcome eventuates. And this was a, uh, a decision we made a long time ago. We wanted to get this out ahead of the election and drawing broadly across the center's expertise, everything from foreign policy through to trade investment, uh, uh, domestic US political issues and of, of, of importance to Australia uh, more broadly. Um, and to talk through the essay today, and, and there it is up on our website, and I encourage everybody to to, to download it and or browse it online. Um, to, to, I want to draw on some of the key contributors today uh, to, to, the, uh, to the publication. And uh, this is a very small subset of the 12 or 13 authors uh, who made contributions. But today I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Ashley Townsend. Ashley is Director of the Foreign Policy and Defence part of our operation here at the United States Study Center. Um, he also works on uh, strategic affairs with a focus on the Indo-Pacific region, region. He is the founding convener and co-chair of the US-Australia Indo-Pacific Deterrence Dialogue, an initiative uh, stood up here through the, through the US Study Center. And, and he lectures uh, in the center's postgraduate studies program. And, and like or everybody at the US Study Center. He is a frequent contributor to Australian and international media and at some of Ashley's output has appeared in the Financial Times, CNN, AFR, Bloomberg, ABC, Sky News, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, good morning, Ash. Um, and um, I'm also joined by Stephen Kirchner, uh, Dr. Stephen Kirchner. Um, Stephen directs our trade investment program here. Uh, at, the, at the US Study Center. He's also a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute in Canberra. And previously, he worked as an economist with the Australian Financial Markets Association. Um, also joining us is Grana Grigic, who is jointly appointed between the US Study Center and the Department of Government and International Relations here at the University of Sydney. And uh, she is uh, a frequent guest uh, out with our sister center, the Perth US Asia Center, where she has an adjunct lectureship in US foreign policy at the University of Western Australia. Uh, Garana was a visiting fellow at Harvard in 2019, and much to our regret, but it's great news for Garana in 2021, she'll be uh, spending six months um, at NATO's Defense College uh, in Rome, not a bad gig. Uh, well done, Garana. We'll miss you, but i um, glad to have you with us today. Garana's research interests include US politics and foreign policy, transatlantic relations, conflict resolution and democratization, and, and again, uh, many media appearances on behalf of the US Study Center. And finally, um, uh, Charlie Edel, uh, Dr. Charles Edel, pardon me, a uh, senior fellow here at the US <laughs> Study Center. Um, Previously, Charlie was Associate Professor of Strategy and Policy at the US Naval War College uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. And he also worked in government in the United States, serving on the uh, staff of uh, Secretary John Kerry and Secretary of State's um, policy planning staff uh, from 2015 to 2017. Uh, Charlie's the author of The Lessons of Tragedy, uh, Statecraft and the World Order, which appeared while he was with us here at the US Study Center last year and also his earlier book, Nation Builder, John Quincy Adams and the Grand Strategy of the Republic. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, what I wanted to do um, this morning 
is to it's to get some brief takeaways from from each of you about a your contributions to Red Book Blue Book um, charting possible courses for US foreign policy and other policies, by the way, and their implications for Australia under either election scenario, the Red Book, of course, um, that, that's code for a, a second Trump administration. Blue Book, um, that's code for uh, Joe Biden winning the election and, uh, and forming an administration that would come to power in, in late January of, of 2021. Um, I guess from my perspective, having written an overview chapter, I, I just had the following um, observations before we get into individual contributions, just to sort of tee it up a little bit. Um, there is tremendous, uh, so, so safe to say, interest in this election around the world and especially in Australia. Um, and I think at least superficially, there's this sense that, boy, oh boy, there's so much at stake and, and, and things will change big time depending on the outcome. And, and there is a large measure of truth in that. Um, but there are also significant points of continuity, particularly in security policy, defense, foreign policy, that I think, you know, we, we might get to as well. Um, um, Indo-Pacific strategy and the way either administration prosecutes that, I think, is a, will be a big focus and of, of, um, of our conversation today is a big focus of the volume, number one. Um, and, and here I think it's very helpful um, to, to perhaps have a conversation about drawing out those points of difference and continuity, um, I think particularly in foreign policy, and perhaps uh, with respect to Indo-Pacific, uh, clarifying our views at least as to points of divergence and, and, and continuity depending on the election outcome and, and, and critically the implications for Australia, uh, a big agenda item uh, uh, for, this, for us this morning. Um, uh, last thing, last comment from me, um, and it'll be a pretty high level um, comment. And that is, look, one of the legacies of the Trump administration if it's re-elected or if it's not, I think is the cement uh, a change in the strategic mindset, at least in the United States, about um, the uh, that we are in a period of great power rivalry uh, and strategic competition, sort of being the watchword of the day, the single biggest factor animating American strategic thinking, uh, and and that will survive under any election outcome. I, I think that much is is safe to say. And for keen observers of American foreign policy and strategic thinking, that won't be a revelation. I think that's not a bad departure point, though, I think, for getting into some of the contributions, uh, certainly from Ashley, Charlie and Garana, um, with, a, with a much more dedicated focus on foreign policy and security. I'll, I'll, I'll tee it up with that observation that I think is, is not controversial. And then I think it, that's appropriate now to hand off to, to hearing from from uh, from from Ashley, could you lead us out with um, take it from there, Ash? About you know perhaps summarising for us your contributions to the volume, and perhaps hitting on that theme I teed up about points of um, continuity and and points of divergence under uh, any election under either election scenario. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Simon, for that uh, <clears throat> for that introduction. I think you've set the scene uh, really well. Um, uh, I agree, let's begin with continuity, that Indo-Pacific strategy is going to be important for whoever wins next week. Um, and China and strategic competition with China is more or less um, set to be the framework for the next administration, whether that's a Trump two or a Biden, incoming Biden administration. Um, that's really the first judgment I come to in Red Book, Blue Book. Um, both of the, the incumbent and the incoming defense team agree with the framing um, of the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which let's remember was not written by Donald Trump himself, but was written um, in large part by the Pentagon, overseen by um, Secretary Mattis when he was running the department. Um, they agree on the framing of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and interstate strategic competition being the defining trend now for US global defense strategy and for focusing US regional priorities. Um, and over the course of the Trump administration, it's become clear that the Pentagon is definitely trying to prioritize the Indo-Pacific and has now declared that to be 
the priority theater for the United States defense strategy. Now look, both sides, again, more or less uh, agree on this. Uh, the Trump administration has uh, sought to a certain extent uh, to reduce forward presence in the Middle East and to end the so-called forever wars. It hasn't been entirely successful. There have been some efforts to withdraw successfully from Afghanistan. There have been other efforts um, uh, to ramp up uh, deployments uh, in the context of a maximum pressure strategy with regards to Iran, which have um, detracted from that overall strategic pullback from the region. But nonetheless, it has been an ongoing objective. And likewise, um, for a Biden administration and for the Democrats more broadly, um, there is a strong interest in ending the forever wars. Um, it's fair to say, though, that both, both sides of US politics have sought to do this for some time. The Middle East has a habit of keeping uh, on drawing US forces' attention and resources back into, if you like that, that sort of sinkhole of US global strategic priorities, but it is nonetheless the framework. Um, I think the second continuity and, and, and building on that uh, Indo-Pacific um, focus or attempted focus going forward is, um, is the fact that the Department of Defense and the US defense establishment broadly is not yet um, uh, set on the best way to pursue a strategy of strengthening deterrence vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, a simple way to put this is, is the fact that any large and complex bureaucracy has lots of different um, uh, opinions, lots of different perspectives on the best way to proceed. And while I think it's fair to say that the US military services, that is the Army, Navy, Nef uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, etc., um, the US Department, that's like the equivalent of the Australian Defense Department, the National Security Council, and other parts of the administration, again, all agree on the need to focus on China, to focus on long-term strategic competition. Uh, different parts of the military want to do that in different ways. So for instance, when it comes to the US Indo-Pacific Command focused in Hawaii, their requirements um, are not just about building high-end uh, future capabilities for large-scale deterrence or large-scale warfighting, that's a part of it, but they're also very, um, uh, they, they need to be focused on the day-to-day, -day, on the shaping and influencing aspect of, of, of regional competition in the gray zone, so to speak. Um, at the same time, the US services being the, the continental manifestations of their own um, domain of warfare, are in becoming increasingly focused on, you know, do they have the right inventories and the right systems for a major power competition era? Are they building for the future sufficiently right now? Are they maintaining uh, legacy platforms? That is to say, existing, you know, air for, um, um, uh, airplanes, existing ships that are already in the US military inventory that are needed while they prepare for the future? Are they balancing that correctly? That's their focus. And then there are other parts of the defense establishment that have, again, um, different, um, uh, different bureaucratic incentives. So the bottom line here is that there isn't yet an agreement on the best way uh, to proceed. And that is going to have an impact and be a decision for the next administration to make. But it will have an impact in the short term on how to roll out that Indo-Pacific focus. And look, finally, um, on continuity, and, and I think a, a big, a, a really big issue for both administrations and a big issue that the Study Center has been tracking for some time now is, is where the US defense budget sits in all of this. The US defense budget at nearly $750 billion is obviously astronomical by global standards, but the United States global interests and global presence is also astronomical. And uh, if you look at what the United States defense strategy um, considers is necessary for US interests and considers is necessary to resource US interests, um, they, and this is a bipartisan position, call for a three to 5% real growth in the defense budget. This quite simply is not going to happen under either administration. Uh, the Trump administration, while writing that strategy, has only achieved that growth in the budget once in its three and a half years of government. Um, the Democrats, if they win next week, um, uh, are not going to do what some of the um, far left um, uh, congressional Democrats have called for, that is the Bernie Sanders, the, um, the AOCs of Congress, who would like to see um, a, a major reduction in the defense budget. But there will be pressure on Biden to reduce, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 economic and social fallout, to reduce defense spending and focus on the guns, on the butter issues rather than the guns issues for Democrats, which is which has often been a case. So I guess we can probably expect um, a contraction in the defense budget in real terms. 
Um, possibly around a 5% cut if there's a Biden administration over the course of that four years are some expectations. At the same time as we're seeing an absolutely ballooning national deficit that will exceed the post-World War II um, peak of 106% of GDP in the next few years on the, on the watch of the next president. So if you put all of that together, uh, focus on the Indo-Pacific, uncertainty over the best way to proceed in terms of shoring up deterrence, and a budget that is not going to extend to realizing either Indo-Pacific objectives or US global strategic objectives in their entirety, uh, Australia still has a lot um, of work to do and a lot to be concerned about in terms of how we can assist the United States and how we can assist other like-minded partners in the region to offset some of those um, concerning trend lines and together work to reduce the threshold for sustained American engagements and to work in the interests of the Alliance and partner network with other countries in Southeast Asia, with Japan, with the Quad, um, including India, to together um, 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 advance strategy of collective uh, defense and collective regional deterrence. So I'm going to might leave it there. We can come back to some of the more fine grained yeah. differences between the two later. Yeah, thanks, Ash. Um, this issue of um, competition within the United States defense establishment that you talked about. I, I want to come back to that perhaps a little bit later on uh, under the heading of just how much room is there for defense and foreign policy and international strategic concerns when the dashboard is lit up about COVID, the state of the US domestic economy. Perhaps we can come back to that um, uh, in discussion a little bit later on. Thanks, Ash. Um, Charlie, could I could I turn to you now? Um, um, I, I think you know you sit at a very interesting place, sort of on the American side, um, um, with your background, uh, and and about to return to the United States shortly after the election. Um, um, I'm enormously interested for our audience to get a readout on your red book, blue book uh, contribution, uh, and and where either administration. Uh, might take U.S. foreign policy. Sure. Uh, thanks, Simon, and thanks very much uh, to everyone who's tuning in and my fellow uh, colleagues and panelists. Uh, look, although um, China was barely discussed uh, during the debates, if you look at American public opinion, if you look at the significant moves that Congress has taken over the past couple of years, and if you look at how both Trump and Biden have framed their campaigns, how the United States deals with China is probably the most important foreign policy issue in the election and will certainly be among the most important set of policy decisions for the next presidential administration. Now, a couple of quick points, Simon, about why that's true, how Trump and Biden think about the US-China relationship, and significantly for this conversation, uh, what that means for Australia. Uh, so first, uh, there is a palpable sense of anger in the United States towards the Chinese government. This has been growing for a while, but recent polling shows that uh, these are hardening attitudes towards China on most issues. Uh, nearly three quarters of Americans, 73%, now say they have an unfavorable view of China. I think that's topped only by Australia. And now more than 60% believe the United States should take steps to hold China accountable for its handling of the coronavirus and for exploiting US trade policies. The effects of such sentiment can be seen in an increasingly assertive, well-resourced and critically bipartisan congressional legislation. But as popular attitudes in congressional legislation, as much as those matter, presidential attitudes matter much more in the creation of foreign policy. Now, both Biden and Trump support a sharper approach to dealing with Beijing, but I think that it's the nature of what U.S. competition looks like will shift considerably based on who emerges as the president after the election next week, which means that on a range of different issues and a bunch of different type of challenges for traditional allies like Australia, those will differ greatly based on who the next occupant of the White House is. Now, if we see a second Trump term, I think that would result in closer US-Australia ties. But, and there's a big but here, that would likely prove the exception rather than the model for US alliances as Trump puts more pressure on South Korea, on Japan, and increasingly turns away from and possibly abandons NATO altogether. 
Another Trump term will likely result in more abrupt decisions in the area of decoupling uh, with China. There's also the distinct possibility, and uh, Stephen, I'd be really curious for your take on this, that Trump would seek another trade deal with Beijing because the one that he signed in January of 2020 failed in every metric that Trump held up. It failed to curb China's subsidies to SOEs. It did nothing to halt rampant IP theft of US businesses and technology. And it did not result in increased Chinese purchases of American goods. Now, in that eventuality, I think Australia will need to continue identifying areas of shared interest with the US and use the existing mechanisms and bilateral fora to pursue joint goals. Australia will also need to be prepared for a United States that's even less committed to multilateralism and a White House that will not play a leading role defending democracy around the world. On the other hand, if Biden ends up winning, Australia should prepare for return of the US to international fora, greater emphasis on values and human rights in foreign policy, and an increased push for coordinated technology and economic policies between the US and its allies. Climate policy will take a much greater role in the Biden administration. Southeast Asia will occupy a central focus of America's Asia policy. And Washington will likely commit more resources to its diplomatic aid uh, and development budgets. Finally, I would say that Australia in a Biden administration should reinforce his natural instincts for alliances by early demonstrations of support for the alliance. Uh, finally, I just note that regardless of the outcome, because you had asked about continuities, mm -hmm. fundamentally, strategic competition between the U.S. and China will continue regardless of who is elected in November. However, and I think this is a pretty important one, there are a number of variables beyond the presidential election that will play a role in shaping what exactly that policy looks like. And I would point to three. Uh, the composition of the new Congress, which we won't know until after mm -hmm. the election, uh, the willingness of allies such as Australia and Japan to shoulder a greater role in their own and regional defenses. And perhaps most important of all is China's actions and the increasingly global concerns about its activities. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and, and plenty there to come back to uh, in, in, in Q&A. Um, um, Garana, um, I'll come to you next. Um, one early... Um, takeout that I got both from the contributions in Red Book, Blue Book, but it, it's also, you know, buzzing around Australian strategic affairs and global strategic affairs is that a Biden win um, would see the, the NATO allies coming rushing back in. Hi, remember us, <laughs> great to be back. And, and that, um, that couldn't help but present a, a dilution of strategic focus for the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific, um, that the global restoration of alliances and partnerships that, that Biden's talking about and uh, the return to multilateral fora um, um, sort of plays into sort of this, um, you know, some people characterize it sort of the Democrats' uh, natural disposition towards, you know, a transatlantic focus in, in foreign policy. Um, you're our Europeanist on the call today um, and, and, our, and our resident expert here at the Centre on, 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 on those transatlantic matters. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, summarise for us, uh, you know, your thoughts on that and, and other issues that you see of, that Australia ought to be thinking about um, uh, after the election. Um, thank you, Simon, and uh, it's great to be here with uh, colleagues who have contributed to the Red Book, book Blue Book. Um, so you're absolutely right that uh, given the fact that Joe Biden is President Trump's foreign policy antipode, you could say uh, the prospect of his presidency is perceived as a kind of uh, tonic for transatlantic relations. Um, but as we've heard from both Charlie and, and Ashley, um, strategic aspirations on both have focus uh, first, uh, well, on reconstruction at home, but then much more on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I would say that uh, bearing that in mind, we shouldn't under, uh, underestimate the power of inertia, the power of uh, key policy personnel and potential for crisis escalation to consume 
the uh, attention of either of the administrations. And uh, to do that in both of the theaters that Jared Monshine and I talked about in our section in the, in the report. So I just want to first sketch out briefly what that means under a second term of Trump and then uh, under, under Biden presidency. So we expect President Trump's foreign policy in Europe and Middle East to remain largely unconventional and unpredictable. He has certainly broken a lot of taboos and there are indications that if he wins, he will continue to do some more. Uh, so particularly on the transatlantic alliance front, when, we, when it comes to the, the security matters, uh, we could expect more NATO summits ending in an impasse at best, but uh, potentially a deepening of the greatest internal crisis in NATO uh, in the post-Cold War era, uh, so much so that there are plenty of credible accounts that, that point that President Trump uh, could actually uh, push further with, with uh, withdrawal from NATO, for instance. And uh, again, in, in second terms, presidents tend to be uh, more kind of lax and loose in, in foreign policy affairs. And we can definitely expect much more, uh, much more of the, the same in terms of the continuation of unilateralism, which has been evidenced in the imposition of trade tariffs, withdrawal from joint uh, treaties and deals, lack of coordination with, with European counterparts on issues that range from climate change to, to relations uh, with China. However, I want to point out that President Trump is also not friendless in Europe and that there has been actually a huge gap between the uh, poli the, po the rhetoric and the policy that's been implemented on ground, we shouldn't uh, um, uh, put that aside. So uh, certainly Central and Eastern Europeans have been much cozier with President Trump. And some of that is to do with the fact that actually uh, Trump administration's policy is a reflection of a lot of pushes in the Congress to be much more assertive to Russia. So uh, things like European defense, de deterrence initiative and, and similar uh, military kind of posture and in kind of assertiveness uh, um, uh, that we've seen over the past four years are in uh, disagreement and dissonance with what he's been tweeting about, basically. Now, um, to, to go to the uh, uh, Joe Biden front, uh, should he be elected? We know that throughout his career as both a senator and the chairman of the uh, Senate's Foreign uh, Relations Committee, as well as vice president, Biden has really established himself as a firm believer in the alliance. And you're absolutely right, Simon, to say that uh, uh, he will be uh, greeted and, and on at least a symbolic level, this will be a kind of uh, a, a patching up, an instant patching up of relations. Uh, and given that some of his closest advisors are committed transatlanticists, so there is a full bench at the Harvard Kennedy School of the Project on Europe that are basically a shadow government in that sense uh, or government in waiting um, that uh, will no doubt have a sizable imprint on the direction of Biden's foreign policy, making a case for more engagement in Europe. Um, so I would say that those that say that Biden's um, administration will be kind of the third term of Obama might be right on two counts. So first, the imperative of uh, domestic reconstruction will chew up a lot of foreign policy bandwidth and certainly Biden approach to foreign policy will prioritize restoration of alliances, resuscitation of multilateralism, uh, prioritizing human rights and similar, confronting foreign dictators. However, unlike Obama, Biden will have to deal with the China challenge from day one. And this is what both Ashley and, and um, Charlie have alluded to. So in doing that, we will be relying on transatlantic allies, both in policy coordination, uh, but also in continued demands for stepped up burden sharing. Um, and I see the cooperation on trade matters as one of the policy er areas where uh, we will have an early opportunity to develop a more unified front towards China, along with the benefit of the rollback of the tariffs that Trump has imposed on European allies. Um, so 
um, that's kind of the, the, the uh, maybe the, the kind of brief sketch there. Um, but I would just close up by saying that even uh, if we do have the most well-meaning leader in the White House, transatlantic relations uh, for all of those that have been following them are kind of an exercise in deja vu. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, what Stanley Hoffman fam famously said, uh, it's basically a kind of um, a relations in constant crisis given that um, some of the, the, the issues are long durée, are kind of chronic, given the positions that United States and Europe uh, occupy in the international system, along with the fact that US has shifted its strategic priorities away from the uh, uh, continent and um, other issues, as I mentioned, are more acute and are related more to responding to the public health and economic crisis that both of the uh, uh, partners in the transatlantic relations find themselves at present. Uh, thanks, Karana, and, um, and and thanks for underscoring, as you did. Um, um, that's right. I, you know, not only was he vice president, his most recent sort of big foreign policy facing job, but that's right. Joe Biden did chair Senate Foreign Relations. Um, um, my time in the United States, I was much more aware of his um, domestic policy focus and some of the legislation he got through the Senate. But uh, thank you for reminding us of that. Um, Stephen Kirchner, um, um, it's been an interesting <laughs> time in, in, in the over, you know, one of the responses to the China question, both in Australia and the United States, has been sort of this fusion of uh, national security concerns into uh, trade investment, uh, scrutiny of foreign investment in particular, uh, particularly in sensitive areas, it, it's sort of, uh, and, and now more recently even, sort of a return of industrial policy uh, by any other means. Um, I'm wondering if you could sort of perhaps give us your sense of, you know, how that continues or diverges uh, under a, uh, either election outcome. And, and also, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to try and do a lot in a short period of time. Um, David Uren's chapter uh, looked at sort of what might be going on in the domestic U.S. economy, which, which you know, I, I, you know, any any anybody would I think would agree with this is, is at least you know, in the medium to long term at least a, a foundation of American power um, and and it's uh, military in a military sense and in the, all the various senses that we use that term national power. Um, the prospects for American economic recovery, and the sorts of policies that might come out from either administration uh, to, to work on that? Sure. Uh, I think under either administration, you will see the increased interest in strategic industry and trade policy that you refer to. Uh, and this will be framed very much in terms of uh, strategic competition, uh, as Ash suggested. Uh, but I think the US is somewhat schizophrenic in its approach to trade and investment with China. And we saw this very dramatically in the case of the phase one US-China uh, trade deal at the end of last year. So if you look at that deal, almost every element of that agreement uh, actually sought to bind the US and China closer together. Uh, it would have seen a, on paper at least, it would have seen a dramatic increase in US exports to China, so making the US more dependent uh, on China in relation to trading goods and services. And another major aspect of the agreement was an attempt to get China to open up to US investment. Uh, and so a large part of the deal was in fact aimed at getting US multinationals to increase their investment footprint in China. So for all the talk of decoupling, uh, I think the US is in a very similar position to Australia, where on the one hand, we're trying to capture the potential economic benefits of uh, trade and investment with China. Uh, but on the other hand, being very mindful of the potential risks to national security uh, that might arise from uh, closer uh, economic uh, integration. So in many ways, the US faces the same balancing act uh, as Australia. Um, so uh, I'm not completely enamored of the decoupling thesis. I think what we'll see in terms of decoupling is very much on the margins of the US-China uh, relationship. Uh, 
uh, and it will be very focused on issues uh, related to uh, investment and uh, uh, technology, particularly where that technology has, has dual use. So if we're framing this in terms of uh, changing continuity, uh, I think in the event of a, a Biden administration, we will see a dramatic change of tone in the trade and investment area. Uh, but the change in substance will actually be uh, much longer in coming. Um, so if we go back to the beginning of the Trump administration, for example, uh, in Trump's first year in office, he actually did very little in terms of uh, trade uh, and investment. Uh, very little with respect to China. And this wasn't because he didn't have an agenda, uh, he clearly did, uh, but it was a function of the fact that it takes quite a bit of time to spin up the, the wheels of the government uh, to implement that agenda. And so I think there'll be a fair amount of uh, political and bureaucratic inertia uh, in the trade and investment space, such that the, the change in tone won't immediately be followed up with uh, a change in substance. Uh, and so one of the issues that a Biden administration will have to wrestle with is what does it do with the legacy of Trump tariffs? Uh, and I don't think that the tariffs are going to be uh, wound back uh, immediately. I think they'll stay in place for some time. Uh, firstly, because removing tariffs can be disruptive in the same way that imposing them can be disruptive. Uh, and the US will want to go through a consultative process in relation to the removal of the tariffs. Uh, in fact, US law obliges the administration to consult on changes in trade policy. Uh, so I think there'll be a fair, fair amount of um, uh, inertia there. And I think a Biden administration will probably also want to use the tariffs as leverage in any trade negotiations that uh, it has. So as Biden, a Biden administration seeks to re-engage uh, with other countries on trade, uh, it will take us at starting point this, this legacy of tariffs. And uh, I think they will uh, approach this as being uh, something that they can use to uh, obtain uh, concessions. Uh, the trade strategy will be very different. So there'll be a much greater focus on doing this, uh, not on a bilateral basis, which was the, the Trump administration's focus to trying to tie together trade deals in various ways. Uh, there'll be a greater focus on regional agreements and of course, a much greater uh, level of support for um, multilateralism. Um, one of the things I will be watching for with the Biden administration is the extent to which the partisan realignment uh, on trade uh, that has occurred under Trump uh, actually persists into a, a Biden administration. Uh, so one of the, the things that uh, Trump's uh, focus on tariffs has done has actually been to see uh, Democrats take a much more favorable view of international trade. Um, and one of the remarkable things about US public opinion on this issue is that support for international trade uh, and immigration, in fact, uh, has increased while Trump has been in, in office. I think this is partly a function of Trump very effectively demonstrating uh, the benefits of free trade by showing what happens uh, when you move away from free trade. Um, so one of the things I'll be watching for is can that partisan realignment on trade persist in office? And does this mean that a Biden administration is uh, more favorably disposed to international trade than we might have uh, previously expected from a democratic administration? Yeah, th thanks. We might, we might take up uh, a few questions at this point um, and, or, and get a bit of crosstalk uh, going. Um, one of the... Um, as you, as you talk to Australians, both in government and elsewhere, the word predictability comes up a lot. That Trump has been unpredictable. Uh, uh, and, and that one of the things Biden will be is, is, is predictable. Um, I guess a question for perhaps uh, Charlie and, and Ash. Um, um, a is, is that more one of these, you know, as Garana said, uh, rhetoric versus substance issues with respect to Trump? Is, is that a fair cop on, on, on Trump in, in, a, in a real boots on the ground policy, facts on the ground policy sense? Um, um, and 
What are the signs of reassurance if, if predictability is the watchword of a Biden administration? A, is that the case? And B, what might be some of the early markers of, of that, given just how much is going on domestically in the US? What will be some of those big, perhaps opening overtures that we might expect to see from a Biden administration um, under a headline of predictability and reassurance and restoration of, of uh, alliances and partnerships. Um, Charlie might ask you to just take a quick swing at that. Okay, first of all, I think that's an entirely uh, fair description uh, of Trump, although I would caveat just a little bit that I think he has been uh, tactically wildly unpredictable and at the strategic level, uh, very clear as he's been since the 1980s about what his core beliefs are, a hostility to alliances, a belief that trade, uh, trade is a zero-sum proposition, and that democracy is a sucker's game and that he likes uh, autocrats. I think he's been very predictable about those, although at the tactical level, he's been rather uh, unpredictable. Um, so in, in terms of your question, uh, the if Biden, uh, uh, yes, I think that he would... Uh, return us to not only predictability, uh, but in some ways, and you're seeing a lot of commentary on this in the American media, uh, we'd like to take the entertainment and the excitement uh, and the fire <laughs> uh, and the heart palpitations of our politics. Uh, we'd like it to become boring again. Uh, and I think that would be a good thing. I will say the one thing on the strategic side. Um, one thing that we heard a lot uh, in the last couple of years of the Obama administration is, look, the, the challenge was that you had become strategically predictable, uh, meaning that your opponents knew where your red lines were, and that gives them the advantage. Uh, and I would say that uh, while Trump has clearly moved that in certain senses, there's a challenge here, uh, because actually what the administration wants to do is become somewhat unpredictable to its adversaries, but entirely predictable to its allies and partners. And the challenge that we have seen over the last couple of years is that Trump has made uh, has been unable to cordon those two off. And so what might be good for one becomes detrimental on the other. And so I do think that uh, a Biden administration will want to put predictability to its allies and partners at the core of its administration. And I would look for two things uh, on this. Uh, one somewhat domestic, one somewhat foreign policy. Um, you have heard consistently that America needs to compete with China, but it's not going about the competition the right way. So we've been combative without being competitive. So I would say make an early look for an enormous call for an enormous domestic investment into things that would make America more competitive on an international stage. That's everything from infrastructure to R&D investments to education. Uh, you have bipartisan backing for that. You've had bipartisan backing, Tom Cotton and Chuck Schumer, calling for more than $100 billion of this. Uh, so I do think that would be uh, number one. The second point is predictable on how we talk about American values. And so uh, there's been an abdication on the push for democracy, leadership, human rights uh, by Trump. That is the tagline, right? And there's plenty of evidence to point to on this one. What I think you would see is, because Joe Biden has said that he wants to put restoring American leadership, restoring American values at the centerpiece of his run and American foreign policy, talking about democracy is going to be a core issue. In fact, uh, right before we started this call, Simon had brought up uh, the foreign affairs article that Joe Biden wrote. And he said that the, one of the things that he would do in his first year in office would be to call a summit of democracies, uh, right? So thinking about as democracy comes under more pressure, more assault, more interference from a range of autocratic actors, how can we work together to beef up our own defenses and in some ways on the democracy challenge, go out on the offense? Ash, um, your observations on that and perhaps putting a, what that all might mean for Australia uh, either way, um, um, has a Trump administration been as unpredictable as, as sometimes we, we, well, sometimes, as we often almost always hear, um, and perhaps consistent with the, the Charlie uh, critique. Uh, and, um, and, and what does a, um, 
how, how might that change and what might be some of the signals um, Australia looks for early on uh, in, in a Biden administration? Yeah, look, thanks, uh, thanks, Simon. And, and look, I fully agree with, with Charlie's characterization of Trump's enormous sort of macro level um, predictability in terms of you know, the incoming um, um, transition team, just thinking back four years ago to say nothing of his writing since the 80s, um, pretty much is what we got. We knew that Donald Trump was going to take issue with allies and partners, in particular with Japan, in particular with South Korea, in particular with NATO. He did that. We knew that he had a bone to pick with China, but kind of enjoyed the, 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 the strength exuded by uh, autocratic leaders like Xi Jinping. Again, um, uh, a, a political system which he has, as early as the early 90s, looked to as something that was powerful and more powerful than American democracy. He's stuck to these things. So I don't think we mean predictability in those terms. I think when people talk about the unpredictability of a Trump administration, uh, again, as Charlie says, they're looking at more tactical level. And I think the biggest manifestation of that has been the tactical unpredictability of the president's own directions, of his whims and fantasies, of the way that they've been contributed, um, uh, uh, contributed to uh, policy debates in completely unprecedented ways, undercutting his own officials many times, blindsiding at trusted allies and partners, causing um, total disruption to what has normally or at least traditionally been a fairly well-oiled machine uh, from the White House, executed through the NSC, managed across the interagency. Of course, there are differences and always problems, but he has completely upset that process by his own personal unpredictability and intervention through social media fundamentally. That has been, I think, the single biggest cause of frustrations and headaches in, in at least Asian capitals and Asian bureaucracies, and I'm including Australia here, during the course of his administration. Um, there's a bit of a love-hate thing going on with Trump as well that it's probably worth pointing out for our viewers. Um, 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 you know, of course, uh, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that um, many um, US allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific um, will be relieved when there is a degree of strategic predictability or at least allied assurance at the heart of US foreign policy again. And of course, when it comes to those allies that have been marginalized, in particular Japan and South Korea, with regards to their own bilateral um, you know, military posture arrangements, for example, that where Trump is trying to get them to pay 500% more than they have previously to sustain US troops there, they are going to be happy to see a return to the sensible center, which is to say there will be burden sharing debates. They are always um, a transactional process at some level, but they're ones that are done in good faith with a shared view of common strategic interests. Um, at the same time though, um, what Asian allies and partners have liked about Trump, and there have been some things, has been his focus, rhetorically at least, and again, I think the bureaucracy has done more than the president here, but his focus on China um, as a competitor. Not necessarily an adversary, but certainly not a partner, or certainly not a partner with whom the transaction on global issues um, 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 took precedence over competition on geopolitical issues. So there is a sense, at least, and I think what the region is gonna be looking for from an incoming Biden administration is a sense uh, that they'll get the Goldilocks conundrum right. Uh, that if Obama, if the Obama administration was too soft on China, at least on certain geopolitical issues like the South China Sea, the island building, freedom of navigation, and if Trump has been too confrontational and not sensible in the way that he has worked with allies as part of that strategic competition, or not as sensible as he could have been, um, we're gonna to wanna to see a Biden administration get that just right. And that's a really hard thing to do. I think the final point I'd, I'd make here is again about the fact um, that when it comes to an incoming Biden administration, that instinct to return to a more establishment heart, a more established center of US foreign and strategic policy uh, could pose some headaches uh, for Australia. And here I'm thinking in particular about the global and ideological elements of an incoming uh, Biden administration's foreign policy. There is nothing, let me be clear here, wrong or, uh, or ignoble about a League of Democracies, a Summit of Democracies rather, um, that would focus on building democratic resilience vis-a-vis um, -vis disinformation, building democratic coordination on setting new standards for technology, um, uh, for setting new standards on infrastructure development, etc. These are issues where a D10, as we've discussed in this administration, um, or a Biden um, Summit of Democracies will be very important. 
But there are other issues that are not as global. And when it comes to a rhetorical framework for US foreign policy in Asia that prioritizes democracy, um, if not the spreading of democracy, but certainly the, the values of democracy ahead of maybe other more realist, more zero sum um, uh, uh, real politic calculations, that does have the potential to turn some countries off in Asia, particularly when we look at the fact that in Southeast Asia, we are seeing a retreat of democracy. We do have many states that are at least non-democratic or non-liberal, and many of these states are critical and will be critical allies and partners, or at least partners, not just the US, but of Australia, of Japan, of India, of others in the region. So getting that balance right is important. Likewise, with the global focus, um, you know, the restoration agenda, um, a, a, a incoming democratic team that for a range of good and maybe not so good reasons, wants to reinvigorate um, deterrence and competition vis-a-vis -vis Russia, does have the potential to, with a very well-oiled lobby machine that is NATO, distract limited resources from the Indo-Pacific. Now, I know that many in the Biden incoming team are aware of these challenges, but there's a lot of path dependency that can build up nonetheless. Um, Grana and Stephen, I, the, the other thing that Biden has been promising um, and it hasn't really come up in the conversation thus far is to put climate change considerations at the center of not just US domestic policy, a proposed $1.7 trillion spend over 10 years on renewable technologies and you know, getting uh, electricity generation carbon zero in the US 2035 and net zero across their whole economy 25th, all, all that. Um, but to put it at the center of American foreign policy and defense policy as well. and and. Um, I guess a question, you know, for the whole group, but but I really do want to hear uh, Garana. I mean, imagine this plays pretty well in Europe, number one. Um, but a question for the group: um, What does that look like? What does it mean to put climate change considerations at the centre of foreign policy? I got a, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit hazard. That means going going back to Paris, number one. But number two, it's also an element that the Biden administration differentiates itself from Trump and wanting to engage China constructively on too. But, but three, what are the implications for Australia of that, where I think in very short order, you could go from an environment where you've got an Australian government looking at its American partner government being slightly to its right, as it were, on scepticism of international climate for and blah, 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 uh, to all of a sudden exactly the opposite, uh, being on its left flank um, proposing uh, uh, economy-wide targets and wanting to export it into its foreign policy and into its uh, defence policy as well uh, would really welcome a set of observations on that. Um, uh, but but we haven't heard from Garana and Stephen for a while. Be welcome, you guys, taking a swing at that from the European perspective or any other perspective, Stephen, economic, um, um, uh, Whatever, whatever way you'd like to handle that one. Sure, I'm happy to go first, Steve. Uh, Thanks, Grana. Um, so I would say you're absolutely right in pointing out that there are these domestic uh, uh, pushes to uh, make climate change, obviously, the front and center of domestic reconstruction and to marry it with a kind of uh, twin priority of uh, investment in infrastructure. And this is basically how Biden has been selling his version of the Green New Deal, basically reinventing the way that the economy works, but also to rethink uh, the way that uh, America has been built and, and kind of think about the infrastructure that has largely been developed in the kind of golden age of post-World War II period that needs obviously to be updated uh, on so many fronts. Um, in terms of transatlantic relations, I think that there is uh, obviously a push that's going to be coming from Europe. Actually, this is where Obama was already cooperating with Europe on the US-EU uh, Energy Council. There was this uh, cooperation that was first spurred on by the fact that when Obama came into office, uh, U.S. wasn't uh, energy independent, so to speak, and we have to remember that back in that time, actually, uh, there were serious questions that were posed uh, after uh, Russia actually blocked the uh, exports of uh, gas into Eastern Europe, and there were all these messes, but obviously shale revolution kicks in. U.S. now still lives basically on the heels of the second 
revo the, the shale revolution, kind of the age of abundance. And this is actually something to consider and throw into the mix because obviously energy policy comes very close with climate policy and something that we have to uh, think about uh, the way that both Obama and Trump administration have been using actually energy as one of the ways to engage with Europe and particularly as a tool of, of security uh, in Europe and uh, a source of diver diversification of sources of energy uh, in Europe. Having said that, Europe has firmly committed that it's going to be carbon by 2050. Um, so this is going to be a kind of a very interesting uh, a kind of maze to navigate where on the one hand, you do have this uh, commitment uh, from Europe and, and certainly a vision to make itself less dependent on Russian gas, uh, but also to, to have more renewables because of the environmental issues. But also uh, Joe Biden very clearly said that this is not the end of fracking, for instance, and mm -hmm. uh, especially appealing to Pennsylvania of the world in, in saying that, and again, what that might pertain uh, for, for US uh, LNG exports into Europe, which we know have been coming steadily and which have been part of the bargaining chips when uh, Trump imposed those uh, tariffs on uh, European allies and partners. Stephen, your, your, your observations on the prominence that climate change is playing in the, in the Biden policy platform I get given that you know there's at least a 80 90 depending on which poll aggregator you you follow that that biden will be the next president of the united states well i think climate change already features in us eu uh, trade relations because the eu has a requirement that uh, any trade deal that it might ent enter into requires the the other side to be a signatory to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. So strictly speaking, uh, an EU-US trade deal uh, under the current administration would be impossible uh, unless either the EU relaxed that requirement uh, or the Trump administration signed up to the Paris Accords. And I don't think either of those two things are, are likely. So in the event of a Biden administration, one of the things I think they would seek to do is to restart the TTIP negotiations, the uh, Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership. So essentially a US-EU trade deal. And to the extent that the Biden administration makes uh, climate change uh, uh, an element of its uh, trade policy, then this would put the US and the EU on the same page. Uh, but by the same token, combining climate and energy issues with trade and investment issues uh, potentially complicates the successful conclusion of any agreement. You're adding a whole set of new issues on which the US and the EU, for example, uh, may not agree. Mm -hmm. uh, so perversely, you could have a situation where climate change becomes uh, an obstacle to uh, uh, greater economic integration, uh, but also the successful conclusion of the trade agreement might stand in the way of reaching a common position on climate change. Climate, climate, yeah. um, so on the one hand, you can sort of see scope for a grand bargain to be struck across all of these different policy issues, but at the same time, you're massively complicating the negotiating task. Mm -hmm. Charlie, um, in, in, in 60 seconds or less, um, I'm wondering if you could share some thoughts about the way that climate change considerations under a Biden administration will find footing in, uh, in, in domains perhaps away from trade and investment, but in other elements of foreign policy and defense policy. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I can do it in under 10 seconds uh, that climate policy uh, will be in a potential area of cooperation uh, between the United States under Biden and China now is the important part, but it won't be held ransom to all the other strategic considerations. Uh, so it will be great to have China come to the table along the United States as the United States plays a role, but the United States will not hold in ransom for China's cooperation, the more competitive aspects of its policy. Uh, I think that will be a key uh, point to how uh, Biden approaches this. And uh, the larger point I would make on this is there's been some discussion about whether uh, a Biden presidency 
would be Biden 1.0 or uh, uh, Obama 3.0. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think uh, we actually already have the answer uh, because Biden has said, uh, because of fundamental changes in geopolitical relations, uh, Biden has said during his campaign that Xi Jinping is a thug and we're going to deal with this by becoming more assertive as a democracy. There ain't no going back. Although, of course, because if you think about the various personnel that will be slotting into senior roles, there will, of course, be people right. from the uh, Obama administration in very senior roles. Okay. Um, Ash, um, last word from you. And again, 30 seconds. Uh, where, where Australia, particularly in, on the security side of the ledger, uh, your constituency, as it were, that you're in most uh, close conversation with in, in, in Canberra, how this emphasis on climate change, you know, is being anticipated or what it might mean uh, for, for the close US-Australia uh, security relationship? I don't think that um, it will have a direct impact on the security relationship. Um, and obviously when you talk climate change with um, Australian um, interlocutors, a lot depends on who you're talking to. Uh, it's clear what the public wants. It's clear that from an Australian public opinion perspective, US leadership on climate change and Australia's participation in that will be popular in Australia. Of course, depending on the government of the day, the policy preferences of Canberra could vary in that respect. And that could certainly make for strained negotiations or some friction between the US and Australia on this issue. Um, having said that, uh, and, and in the way I began my comments, we can have those disagreements um, in the US-Australia relationship. We can have fierce disagreements on those issues and yet cooperate on all of the other things that are there. The US-Australia relationship is well-versed in doing that. I wouldn't be concerned. Okay, we'll, we'll, um, we'll make that the last word. Um, um, it was ambitious to get through everything that's on the table um, with respect to this election and from a, a variety of viewpoints that span uh, the globe and so many uh, policy domains. Um, uh, thank you to my colleagues, um, Ashley, Charlie, Garana, uh, Stephen. Um, great to have an hour of your time uh, uh, and, and our audience's time today. Thank you so much uh, for giving us that hour. Uh, we are literally counting hours until uh, the close of polls uh, Wednesday afternoon, Australia time. Um, um, so thanks for giving us one of those hours. Um, Janine and team in Sydney, do we have an event to tell our people about? Yes, we do. <laughs> After the election next Friday, it's our regular um, chat with Gordon Flake, uh, from, who is the CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre. And we are working on, all we can say at this point, uh, is a very special lineup of guests from Washington DC and elsewhere around the United States. Um, for a conversation about where we might be. Um, a, do we have a result? Uh, and if we do, what is it? And if we don't have a result, when might we and what might it be? And, and how's that all tracking? But again, with a big focus on the readout for Australia and, and, and that sort of speaks to the guests that we're, we're lining up for that, for that special event. Uh, Friday, November 6, one o'clock, uh, slightly later time to accommodate Perth, a, lunch, a more a lunch hour talk here, uh, late morning talk in Perth. Thanks everybody. Uh, good luck over these last four mad days before the election uh, with, with A, your level of interest, but B, the, the writing and analysis that we're all doing here at the study center as well. Mm -hmm.